we're live. Hi, everyone. We're here. <laughs> Hi, we I'm are, Tracy. We are back and live. This is Michelle. Excited to, to be back and talking to Tracy. It's been a long time. Long time, but it's fun. And we're in a cadence and have a plan. So it'll be fun. You'll expect a, a lot more podcasts. I've, I don't know about you, but I've heard from a bunch of people lately who've been catching up on the podcast, which it always surprises me that we have more than a couple of people watching or listening, but we do. So uh, we have some really great plans to bring you some really cool stuff and cool people over the next several months. And great topics too. Yeah. I think we're, you know, we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion. We're going to talk about empathy, uh, potentially analytics. We've got some cool stuff coming. That's all very different, but all relevant and current. Yeah, and all about rebooting HR. And I've been having a lot of conversations lately with various people about uh, the changing world of HR. And I think we've seen that for quite some time. And we've probably seen it no more than we have over the last six months as the whole business world changes. So we're mm -hmm. going to talk quite a bit about that today and catch up and what we've been doing, where we've been. and uh, But there's been a whole shift. So as we record this in, you know, mid-September, uh, just about six months ago, uh, I remember, you know, still being in the office every day and being scared to death of what this thing was and would we have a business in a month, two months? Would we, you know, would, would we all be living in our homes and not able to leave? And, and, you know, we figured out how to coexist and not in a way that we did before, but we figured out how to keep businesses moving and keep people safe at the same time, which isn't easy. Yeah, and it's, uh, I don't think I was that thought out with it. I think it was all of a sudden, it was March, early March, and things were really heating up. And then it was March 17th, and there was a stay in place order in New Hampshire, and, you know, schools went remote. And so we had to figure things out. And I think for a lot of HR professionals, myself included, we felt like we had the weight of the world on our shoulders. We probably yeah. still do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember a lot of early morning calls, a lot of late night calls and a lot of just, um, you know, cause we're look to, to, to handle and a lot of times the health, health and safety and, and certainly to help keep our businesses going through our people and to reassure our people and, um, that was, that was not easy. And it still isn't, it's never easy, but it was a, a particularly huge challenge. But I think in talking to our friends and colleagues, I think that it's been a good time for HR. And I think a lot of businesses are realizing the value of a strong HR team and that really, truly, we're only here if you have the right kind of company because of people. Right. So who better to help lead mm -hmm. through a pandemic than the, the people people. Right, exactly. So the new normal for a lot of companies is most of their employees are remote. And it sounds like a lot of companies are announcing that that's going to continue through January. I'm curious because I get this question a lot, too, from the leadership teams I work with is, is that going to be the new normal forever is working remote kind of the future of HR, right? The future of people. What are yeah, you I seeing or hearing Trace? I think so. I had a, a call the other day with a, um, it was a round table after hours event with um, CHROs from around the country and small companies, big companies and almost everyone, well, actually everybody, even municipalities who uh, had their teams remote. Um, and were keeping their teams remote for the foreseeable future. And I think the key here is, and this is something that we've done, the key here is not forcing people back. We haven't forced people back. I mean, but not forcing people back, but mm -hmm. when's the right time to even allow people back? Because there were some companies on there that, you know, weren't even allowing people back. So, so for us, we're an essential business. So we were operating fully and we have people that don't have that option to work remotely and the people that did, uh, did take that, but then some wanted to come back. And I think it was, a uh, we're keeping less than 50% capacity in the office and 
you know, it looks not even close to the same and everybody's wearing masks. And, but for some people for their mental health and their social health, that was critical that they are back and they go somewhere every day. So for us, mm -hmm. it was that balancing act of, of, okay, for a small percentage of people that had that option to work remotely, when do they, when do we let them come back? And so, mm -hmm. but I think the, the world of work changed forever. I think we, we know that. I think so too. I think CEOs and leaders are worried about accountability or, or productivity. Um, you know, there are some parts of organizations that are very metrics driven and easily tracked on productivity, like sales and customer service and other parts of the organization that that's pretty easy to keep them remote. But I've kind of seen a mix of CEOs wanting employees back in the office. And we heard it too on the Rebels call yesterday. Yep. So I think HR, the future of HR is going to be really trying to balance those right. demands of, and then also and, working on childcare too, which is, which is interesting. And I think the accountability piece is a little bit of bullshit on companies parts too, right? Because I think we still see companies that are struggling with, with uh, control. And if you can't see someone, mm -hmm. how do you know that they're working? I mean, we're in a pandemic really. It's, it's, you have to trust people. You have to trust your people. And certainly there are measures in place and there are certain jobs that can't be done and certain jobs can be done easier. But if you have a high trust, high communication culture, and if your people want to be remote and whether that's nine to five or five in the morning to eight in the morning, like we talked about in the call and, and then maybe sometime at night, whatever it looks like, just be real flexible. And that's, uh, that's going to be the key going forward. So we should have been doing this all along, not just remote, but the, the flexibility. Um, I think the thing mm -hmm. I have the hardest time wrapping my head around is how do we help people, um, parents, those caring for the elderly, and we talked about even pet parents who have to, the, the kennels are closed and have to go home. And it's not just the, the, the parents, but others who are caring for others, whoever those others may be, when that looks a whole lot different and how do we support people? And, you know, we're meeting people where they're at, but I want to make sure that we're not missing anyone. And that's not always obtained by just throwing a survey out there. And that can help if you have a big workforce, but how do we make sure we're supporting each and every one of our people in a way that they need to be supported? I don't have an answer. Yeah, I think it's, I, I don't either. I think it's going to be situational. And I think that HR needs to carry that torch to con consistently push business leaders to check in with their people and ask them if they're okay. And we're going to rely a lot more on the softer side of leadership versus management. And we need to be the ones that are saying to leaders, like, you need to get out there and talk to your people and see what they need, because it's going to be different. Right. I mean, I have children and it's, difficult to manage. Luckily, my oldest is back in school, thankfully. <laughs> but I know that a, a lot of parents don't have that flexibility and they have kids and your, your kids are working from, from home. Mm -hmm. They're schooling from home. So, um, and how do you do that with parents that can't work remotely? That for me is something that, that right. causes me angst. For the people yep. that are working in a warehouse or a distribution center or out, outside sales or you know, UPS drivers and other other yep. mandatory jobs that we need out there, but they, they have children at home that need to be homeschooled. I think yeah, we're going to see businesses rise up that, that will yeah. support that. That might be a company benefit that's offered in the future. Right, right. On-site childcare, you know, we have 45 locations and most of them have eight to 10 people. So that doesn't work for us. Um, some of them are larger, but we're just trying to meet people where they're at. And I keep saying that over and over, but mm -hmm. that looks different for every person. So having, if you're a giant company and you have childcare and you have these policies, that's wonderful and that may work, but every person is unique and every person's situation is really unique. So we're trying to do the best that we can to meet people where we're at. You mentioned about managers having to embrace those soft skills. We had a talk with our regional directors, our COO and I last week about empathy and vulnerability and making sure that they are personally, and they each have region, regions, checking in with every one of their people in the region and not just like, hey, how are you doing? But no, how's your mental health? How are you feeling? How are you doing? And it was a, a long 
difficult conversation because as leaders, they're not used to that. And even as HR, we may not be used to that, but, but you need to embrace getting vulnerable yourself too and really deeply connecting with people and asking those questions and really, truly caring how your people are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think empathy is a skill that not everybody has. I heard a great analogy for empathy on a, on a training I was attending and the gentleman said, if somebody falls in a hole, right? Sympathy is going over to the hole and saying, are you okay? And the person says, yeah. And they're like, okay, great. <laughs> but empathy is the person falls in the hole. You come over and say, are you okay? And they're like, yeah. And you jump in the hole with them and you help them get out. And I think that I love that analogy. And I think that as leaders, we need to, we can't just say, are you okay? Because everybody's response is, yeah. Or, you know, how are you today? Okay. Right. Um, I love that. You know, you have to know that. your people. You have to get in the hole with them. You have to dig them out and help them get out. Like I've had leaders. I usually start my one-on-ones with my leaders and say, how are you today? And when they have okay, I don't accept it. I'm like, what do you mean okay? What, why, why isn't it great? Right. Um, right. And, and figure it out with them because if they're just saying okay, you know, instead of great or wonderful or I'm having a really good day, um, you got to dig. So gonna we're going to talk it. about this more later in a different um, segment, but you would, I think that's a great analogy. You would totally jump in the hole, whereas I would not, right? So we've talked about that where empathy is a, a skill that I had to develop and I hate talking about it in a way, but also I like talking about it because um, not everybody's born with, with that just wells of empathy. Uh, not everyone's a natural empath, but you can develop that. So I had to learn to go, are you okay? Okay, great. All right, wait a minute. Let me make sure that I'm I'm doing that. I make sure that I'm checking in with people. So that's um, mm -hmm. that's something that if that's not your natural tendency, you can absolutely and you should absolutely embrace that and develop that skill. Mm -hmm. Makes me sound like a just a stone cold person, but that is absolutely not the case. So <laughs> you're not stone cold. No, 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 um, no. Yeah, another way, one of the things we did um, early on in the pandemic that I, I thought really got people talking was for parents who were home, homeschooling or remote learning with young children, we sent cards home from myself and another woman executive and just said, we're parents, we're moms, we're dealing with the same thing. We get it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's okay to make mistakes. We're making them every day. Like, just do what you can. And those cards went to all the parents and then they started reaching out and saying, oh my God, this was, I so needed this, or I didn't even realize I needed this until I got it. And then I cried and, you know, doing something you don't have to, um, you know, and it was the idea of the other executive leader, which was great. Um, you don't, I don't think you have to go out on a limb and, and really change, you know, do what works for you to get the answers and to get people to open up. And I think just a little bit of kindness goes a long way. And mm -hmm. um, I think, again, we'll talk about this more as we get, we'll talk about grief in one of our episodes. But um, as you know, my mom died early last month and, and the support and the kindnesses of, of my friends and my colleagues and, and meant everything. And because it's not just a normal grief time, it's a grief time when you can't be out there and hug people and you can't have a funeral and you can't do these things that you would normally do to grieve. So, you know, this whole process as we're going through a pandemic and people are, um, you know, upending their lives in different ways, it's, it's similar to grief. I mean, they may be grieving their mm -hmm. old life in different ways. So we have to really find way to, ways to connect with people. Um, that are meaningful, but are different than they were in the past. And I love that, that card idea. I thought that right. was a fabulous idea. And yeah, personal, it, was, it went over and, really well. Awesome. And, and really heartfelt. That's the thing, right? So that's really, it was really a genuinely heartfelt idea. Mm -hmm. It was also, I think, um, like a mental release for myself too, because as we wrote the card together, it was good to hear from another mom that, you know, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> We're all right. doing the best we can. And 
it was a good, it was a good thing for me, even though, you know, we sent the cards. It was good to hear from another parent that like, it's okay. You know, the kids are going to remember this time as this fun time where we got to do school from home and we had a little, lot more flexibility and fun yeah. than, you know, anything else. So that was, yeah. really, that was really fun. Yeah, it's, and our kids are older. You mentioned they're all, all three of them, they're 21, 17, and 14, are all virtual schooling and working and, and whatnot from home. And uh, But even with that, even with older kids, um, it's a challenge because they may not, they may not demand your time and attention like younger children, but even for parents in our, our workforce with older kids, they're going through some of the worst of the mental health challenges because kids, especially teenagers, mm -hmm. are usually inherently social and there aren't the same activities and there aren't, you know, telling a 17 year old, they can't get together with friends and do a sleepover and do, you know, hang out. Those, those are tough things and that wears on parents. So, uh, and, you know, people with elder care, uh, with elderly parents living at home and who don't have the same opportunities to get out and socialize. It's just, we're truly all feeling it in some way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's been, it's, it's been interesting. It's been heartbreaking. It's, it's been, um, I think I've seen at least our business or our culture really supported our response to, to how this all went. So our people, we learned, we knew, but we learned how resilient they were, how deeply they cared about customers. Uh, and I think because we deeply cared about them and, and tried to do all the right things from the beginning and tried to continually learn and, and listen and just keep doing that. And we'll yeah. continue to do that because we're not, you know, we're not out of it yet. And I think employees will stay. Somebody mentioned on the Rebels call the other day that we do um, that employees are watching. They're watching what you're doing um, with the diversity and inclusion stuff not just what you're saying, but what you're doing. And they're also watching what you're doing with COVID. And they're making decisions for the future based on how their leaders are responding and how their HR organizations are responding. And if you're not saying anything or you're not reaching out or you're not doing anything, they don't think you care. That's the message right. they're getting. And so I think it's so important for organizations to really think about, you know, how they're communicating, what they're communicating, and how often. I know you, your CEO was doing videos every week so that everybody got a, the same message mm -hmm. and they got a check-in and they got his face and yep. uh, when they're not in the office. And I love that. Um, so I think it's, and again, mm -hmm. I think it's up to the HR leaders to make sure that we're pushing this because they don't, I think sometimes leaders think it's business as usual, even though it's not usual. <laughs> and you and have I, to put something yeah. out that you have to push. You do. You do. And we did daily communication from Bill um, in the beginning, and now it's a couple times a week, and he's doing another video today. And um, that, this came up in, in probably a couple of conversations I've been involved in over the past week. Like, your company is going to look to leadership. So if leadership doesn't know what they're doing, your company may just fall apart in a situation like this. But if you have calm, steady leadership who is at least communicating, even if communicating, we don't know what's going on, but we'll be with you every step of the way and we'll keep you informed. And that's how it was in the beginning. Even if you're doing that, at least you're doing something and you're bringing people along with you. And I think I talk about this a lot that that's why our, our virus response team was made up with people on the executive team because we had to make decisions like this and we had to make the decisions to keep mm -hmm. people safe and to keep people informed. And then there were a lot of decisions that were made in the, the local level, like, okay, you have to have social distance barriers, but what exactly they look like was made at the local level mm -hmm. and you have to have some type of plexiglass or some type of shield, but what they look like was made in the local level. But you need to set guidance and you need to, um, you know, particularly a CEO needs to um, lead in a time like, I mean, always, but especially in a time like this. And I, I'm, no secret how I feel about Bill and his leadership and, and there's never been a, a better time, I think, for him to be able to lead us through. He had the, all of those qualities. And I think for companies that maybe didn't have a strong leader, um, I think there's, they struggle. And those questions that get asked, like, how did you, what did you do? I know I can answer them. I, I don't think every company can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it'll yeah, be it's unfortunate. It's interesting. 
Yeah. But I also yeah. think you made a comment earlier about being flexible and kind of not worrying about the policy. I think that that's a great example of how, you know, you need to think a different way about HR and policies. And this is where there's a, there's, you know, a lot of HR professionals that rely on the policies and we have to really think outside of that and reboot your thinking um, on, on, on that. Over you have an employee, right? You have an employee who can't work from home and they have children that need to be homeschooled yeah. um, or do remote learning. How do you support them? Your policy might say, we don't have a work from home policy, right? Or our policy is you can't work from home. You know, I don't think, I don't think that's fair and you're going to lose a good, you're going to lose good employees. It drives me nuts when, and I hate policies anyway, and, and I love what you did with you know, me too. <laughs> yeah, Emerson's handbook is more of a guidebook, and that's what we're really trying to go for is um, have, have um, you know, have a purpose and have uh, procedures, but don't have policies, and there are some things that we're required to have, uh, but don't have these rigid policies that, like, why? And I see this all the time, and you do too, I know, because we've talked about this, but people building a policy, like, there's a lot of HR professionals that love nothing more than, okay, here's a thing, so let me build a policy around it, because Bobby did this one bad thing, and we're going to do create a policy, so no one will do that again, instead of just talking to Bobby about that bad thing that he did that impacts him, and now everybody else is in the, so it's, the, that's a whole other conversation, but um, now's the time if you haven't mm -hmm. shifted your thinking to start. Mm -hmm. For sure. Right, For sure. and evaluate yeah. what you have in place, and make sure that it's equitable for everybody too, right? Right. As we talk right. about diversity and inclusion too. I love talking about that. I love, I love talking about that. So we'll, we'll definitely explore that more and maybe on a, 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 you know, a round table discussion or something, but I know we're, unless you had anything else to cover about this, I wanted to do a check-in before we wrapped up and see what you're up to and share what I'm up to and um, any other business, COVID business updates. Are you good? Nope. You're good. No, I'm so, good. What Hopefully. have you been up to? It's been a while <laughs> since we, I mean, I know, but not everybody who listens knows. So a lot has changed. Um, you know, during COVID, we dealt with a lot of the stress and the weight on our shoulders of remote learning and HR policies and, uh, you know, and um, things like that. We actually went to our home away from home in northern New Hampshire um, during quarantine to hide. There was no cases here, so it was the safest place to be. Um, and we, during that time, reflected and said, you know, we had very busy careers. We have two young children. Why are we doing this? And um, so we just, we made a very intentional decision to pull back and focus on our family. And so I've left my job, my, my boss said, so when I turned 40, I also turned 40 this year. That was a big change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I'm loving 40, but, uh, when I turned 40, he said, what are you doing? I said, uh, well, I'm quitting my job. I'm selling my house. I'm moving up North. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's a midlife crisis. So it, it might be that, um, or yeah. really just an opportunity to focus on our family. And yeah, you know, a friend of mine said, you only live once. So we are making the best way to live it. So we've sold our house in Southern New Hampshire and moved up north and I'm consulting with HR Rebooted. So I'm very excited about that and spending more time with family and living my life much more intentionally than before. I think I should have gone first because it's way more interesting, but no, I think that's, uh, <laughs> I, I love that. And I think you're not unique. And I think that this made particularly a lot of women, particularly a lot of executive women, like you think, you know, what am I doing and how am I doing? Can I, you know, how can I live more intentionally and how can I be there for my family and how can I be there for others? Now I'm 48, so I'm a bit older than you, but when I was 40, I went through some of the, uh, some th similar things didn't sell a house and it went up. But a few years later, I made a decision to um, change jobs. And that's how I ended up at the Granite Group um, to spend more time with family because I was traveling a lot and I was four miles from home and my girls had lost their mom. And it was the best decision I've made career wise. Um, it, just for many, many, many reasons. So 
during this time, as I've been going through the grieving process and with everything with my mom, my company's been so incredibly supportive. So, um, but our day to day is pretty much the same. Everybody's here. We have chickens. We, uh, you know, try to escape to Vermont, Dave and I, for a night once in a while. Uh, but it's been, um, I think the most challenging thing for me is, you know, not being able to go see my mom was the most challenging thing. And, and also looking down the barrel of winter, which I know you love, and we've talked about that. And yes, I will snowmobile, but I won't, you know, love being in the We're going to bring you but, over to the, yeah, the dark side. I don't know. I don't know. But <laughs> I'm not a summer person and we're closing our pool next week and, uh, or not a winter person rather, but, you know, looking down the barrel of winter when I normally go away three, four times for at least short breaks, is challenging. So for my own mental health, I have to see like, okay, what is that going to look like? How do we, you know, get our family through this? Are they going to continue to work remote? Will they go hybrid? Um, you know, will my son go to back to college for his last semester of college ever? Will my daughter go back to high school for her last semester of high school ever? And so these are things that we're thinking about as we go in. But, um, you know, not much has changed for me aside from what I talked about, but um, so the big update was, was you. Oh, you've been very busy though on the presentation yeah. front. Yeah, you know what I've sort of, it's been interesting. My, my CEO is super supportive and, and so I was supposed to be at a bunch of conferences in the spring and um, that obviously didn't happen and half of them went virtual and half of them got postponed. And so I've been doing some of that and I try to, I realize, you know, I try to pick things that, um, I don't want to say are low effort, but like are firmly in my wheelhouse, right? So that um, there are things that I end up talking to in presentations, but I've been doing more of like guesting on podcasts and doing interviews and things like that. So if somebody asked me to do something like that, you know, I'm going to say yes, because that's fun and it's not a lot of preparation. And I like that kind of like what we're doing. We we don't prepare, we go, okay, this is what we're going to talk about and go. I like that a lot. So that's been really mm -hmm. fun. And the more you do kind that kind of stuff, the, the better you get, because as you know, we've talked a lot, I'm an introvert. And so that doesn't come naturally to me. So it's been, um, it's been fun. So I've stayed, that creative side of me has stayed fueled, even though I may be sitting right here. But I don't think mm -hmm. conferences Great. are coming back for at least a year. So I think we've got we've got a ways um, a ways to go doing these kind of things. And I you think done, it might even be longer because there's so much more maybe. cost effective, and people can go to like you spoke at the air was it Arizona Sherm, yeah. You didn't have to leave your house. Like they'll have access to much many more speakers, many more participants. It's not no longer just like geographically limited. So I think, I think we're going to see a change there. It's going to be interesting. So I'm, I'm doing it. I think so too, but I do miss the in-person. So I'm so curious what that will be like in the future. And I'm doing a Katie Anna mm -hmm. uh, with Tessa, you know, Tessa uh, next week and just the group she got. And like, first of all, why am I in with this amazing group of people? And second of all, they couldn't have flown all of those folks in to give those presentations. So they have a, a you know, a regular sized SHRM group that has these great speakers from around the country and uh, because speakers aren't traveling. So they're more open to doing these virtual right. things. And so it's, it's interesting, but, you know, as a speaker and you did HR exchange, so, you know, it's, it's, it's easier in a way because you don't have to leave, but it's, weird because you don't have as much of that audience interaction so you don't you can't see people you can sometimes see the chat but it's right, um, right. yeah it's but it's, it's easier different. to accept doing it because you're not you don't have to for sure travel and and do everything that comes with travel so it's much easier yep. to say oh sure i can do that that day versus like oh let me check flights and daycare right. and all that right stuff, right so. no, um for sure. But I did want to make one more point before we part, because I think you brought it just about full circle, not realizing you did it, where we were talking about leaders having to reach out to their people. I think you and I are where we are today because we have strong support systems. You were talking about how your CEO is very supportive in helping you grow and, and, mm -hmm. and do these speaking engagements and um, push outside your comfort zone. And when making my decision, my husband was really supportive 
And I, I don't think I could have done this or I would have, wouldn't have done this without his full support. And um, I think as leaders, we need, we need to make sure we're part of people's support systems, especially now right. during COVID. Um, right. where they might not have the support at home. You know, my family was also very supportive. I have a very strong support system, um, but not everybody has that. I'm very fortunate. And so, you know, doing that outreach, sending the cards, sending an email, just sending a Slack message or a chat message to say, I was thinking of you today. Yep. How are you doing? You know? Yep. I think that's I a great point. So and I have important. Dave's my... Dave's my biggest supporter. My husband's my biggest supporter and, and has been, and I didn't do any of these things until um, a few years ago. And, and that was at his, you can do this, you can do this kind of insistence, but not everybody does have that. And I think it's like you said, as leaders and as HR professionals and as um, just good humans, it's our responsibility to lift others up and support others. So um, it's something that I've tried to be better about doing and reaching out and connecting and just asking a question. Um, and I, when people do that to me, like it means the world to me. It really does. If somebody just checks right, in like, right. hey, how are you doing? It makes you feel good. And, and so and it's not hard. It's not hard. So that's, I think that's a mm -hmm. great point, especially during this yeah. time. Really great point. So awesome. that's all we got. Um, and I hopefully that kept recording because I don't see the recording right now. But anyway, bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Oh, shit. I hope that kept recording. It did. It, it, I, I had our REC button. I still do. It's still there. Oh, I do. Okay, we're still recording. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>